I think, uh, oh yeah, so then there's the chat which Ellen has just posted in. So um, yeah, there's a few ways to interact with us during the event. So um, we've got our, yeah, our lovely speakers and yeah, I really do want this to be interactive. So you can, any questions that you've got as we're going along or comments or links, you can share them in the chat. Um, you can also, what would be really lovely is um, to see photos of what you're making and crafting today. So we've got a couple of options for doing that. So let me just paste them into the chat now. So you can upload photos of what you're making to the Facebook page, um, which I've just put the link in there, Sustainability Craft at Noon. Um, and I'll hopefully cut that a few times during this, uh, during this uh, workshop so we can see what you're making. <laughs> Alternatively, if you prefer Instagram, you can share it using the hashtag, um, hashtag sustainability craft afternoon, which hopefully I've spelled right, it looks like I have. <laughs> so yeah, that's all of those things. I'm just going through my list. Okay, so just to tell you a little bit about me. Um, so yeah, my name's Becky. I'm uh, in my day job, I'm a lecturer in human geography in sustainability at Lancaster Environment Centre. And that's kind of how I came to be organizing this event for the ESRC uh, Festival of Social Science, uh, which is happening all week this week. Um, but I'm also, it kind of came about, I'm, I'm also a crafter, as you'll probably have gathered, and I'm a mom. And kind of those things have always been um, kind of really important to me too. And I've always been passionate about sustainability, but it's only been like in the last year that I really realized how all those things aren't separate. Actually, they all come together for me in that sustainability is about relationship. And I read this fabulous book uh, called Braiding Sweetgrass, my very coffee stained copy there, um, which I just fell in love with. And um, yeah, I'll be sharing some kind of extracts from that with you today, but it really, um, yeah, that approach, uh, to sustainability as relationship really comes across to me strongly in that and crafting for me that's a, a real way I've discovered like the process of crafting is a way in which I really connect to to other people and also to the natural world around me so um, that's sort of how come I ended up doing this really I was uh, I, I saw the the call out for events for the the ESRC festival and I had to make a decision very quickly and I literally bunged it in before I had chance to think that it was ridiculous and you know that I shouldn't be doing this and <laughs> so as a result I'm now um I invented a new word for my son called X scared which is about like when you're excited and scared at the same time and so that's how I am right now so yeah very delighted that you're here but also uh, nervous as well so our lineup today, I want to say a huge thank you to our speakers today who've um, who volunteered to come and help. So I've already yeah, introduced Ellen, who's helping with the tech side of things, which is fantastic. I'm very grateful for her. Oh, thanks, Melanie. It's a great idea. I hope so, too. And I have already said that I will do more of these if they're popular. So, um, yeah, famous last words and all that. So first up, we've got, uh, in a minute, I'll introduce uh, the lovely ladies from Sewing Cafe Lancaster, who are going to be talking to us about their natural dyes project. Um, and then we've got uh, Hannah, my friend and colleague Hannah Ella, who's going to talk to us about basket making and cordage making. And finally, uh, my colleague, Professor Nigel Clark, who's going to be telling us about his new book uh, out with uh, another of our colleagues, Bron Szynski. Um, so we've got lots of, um, lots of new things today, lots of premieres. And yeah, I'm going to try and interspace the talking with um, with some yeah with some videos and music as well. So thanks, Rachel. Yeah, I'm very good at not sounding nervous when I'm absolutely bricking it. So <laughs> it's a good skill, I think. So yeah, okay, fabulous. Well, on to the interesting stuff then. So um, what I'm going to do to introduce uh, Sewing Cafe Lancaster, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to play two short videos that the very talented Gina Frausen, who's also here today, has made about their natural dyes project, just to introduce what they're doing in Lancaster and why natural dyes are important. So maybe Ellen, you could shout at me in a minute if this isn't coming across, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start screen sharing now. Thank you. 
about the uh the mess up with the screen sharing in the middle you got to see another of uh, a taste of another of sewing cafe's videos there about masks and kindness but yeah i said today we would focus on natural dyes and today we've got with us uh, victoria and gina and i can see ender as well and katrina possibly oh we can see candy i can see loads of sewing cafe people here so um it's really lovely to have you all here and i'm just going to have a chat with them now about the project but if you have questions um or comments and please pop them in the chat and Ellen will help me um, put them to, to the team after we finish speaking. So guys I just wondered if you could start off perhaps by telling me you know why a natural dyes project? 
Uh, okay, I'll, I'll make a start. Um, well, I think uh, in Sewing Cafe we've just become, a, you know, increasingly uh, concerned about the effects of commercial textiles on, on the environment, both in terms of the cost on the actual human, um, uh, uh, on humans that are involved in the trade um, and the effect on, on the actual sort of land. So as part of our efforts to kind of upcycle clothes, um, obviously dyeing is a, is a really useful tool in doing that. Um, and it, it just got us increasingly thinking about natural dyeing and how we could start to use that in, in clothing mm -hmm. production um, ourselves. And we started that about three years ago. We had a workshop from an external dyer, which was absolutely excellent. Uh, we had a, a workshop here at in in my house here um, that was really good and and then we moved on to um, plan an exhibition as part of Fashion Revolution, which was actually supposed to be this April. And we were going to sort of show the possibilities of of natural dyeing at, at the the library in Lancaster. Well, that event got cancelled, but we thought we would really press on with our sort of developing our skills and knowledge in in natural dyeing. So I think um, that kind of really turned our attention to, to growing. So that has been one of our main focuses for this year so that we, we can actually sort of like see the whole process for, from start to finish. Um, and it's been just an absolutely excellent team effort. And I would say for, for all of us, it's been mm -hmm. one of the most positive things in, in the last few weeks where we've been able to um, actually, you know, totally see the, the fruits of our labour right through from, from the actual um, making a gardening space through to actually dyeing and making things with the products. So our um, partnership with, with Claver Hill got going and I wonder, would, Victoria, would you like to talk about that? Um, I don't know. Uh, yes, a few years I've uh, been part of a spot club at Claver Hill in, a few years ago. And the idea of having the natural dye gardens been always there. Uh, but Sewing Cafe wasn't ready until now. Um, they welcomed us and we have a lovely team, but also um, amazing garden. So as you could see the, in the video. So over the season, we've, we've managed to get together like a, a really good uh, range of different uh, species of plants that are, are really good for dyeing. Um, and we've got sort of quite big plans for next year to, to extend that further. Uh, but this year we've grown Calendula, Tagetes, Coreopsis, uh, St. John's Wort, Sunflowers, um, Alkanets, um, we've got Woad, uh, Madder, Weld, Tansy, um, Cosmos. I mean, some, some things you're looking at quite a long-term plan because you, you won't get a crop from Madder for, for four years. So we've got um, a set of two-year-old plants that, that, that we bought. So we'll better crop those in two years. And then we put seeds in last year, uh, which we will be four years off. So that, that's, that's a really good thing. But I just wanted to show you something that was one of the things that really um, sort of really pushed me back into natural dyeing. In going through some, some boxes, I found these, these samples here. Um, and these were things that I dyed in 1980. And I was just so impressed on getting them out of the box mm -hmm. and sort of how great the colours had kind of sort of stayed. Um, and, and these are really great inspiration to me. That's excellent. Thank you, Katrina. And yeah, um, I mean, I was going to ask, you've already mentioned obviously there quite a lot of the plants that you're currently working with. And it's not just plants, is it, as well? Like you had a tonne bag of onion skins delivered to your front door, didn't you? The other yes, day? yeah, we did. So it, it, I think through this project, it's been really, really good how we've been able to, to link into to other projects as well. So uh, last week, we literally received um, a tonne-sized builder's bag full of red onion skins from a, a farmer down south, which was uh, brought to us by um, Dennis Toole, which was really fantastic. So they've been 
cleaned and uh, are ready to ready to go. Um, another really good link up has been um, trying to help Labour Hill with their dock problem. Um, dock, as you'll all know, is an incredibly invasive species, but it's actually really useful in, in the dye bath. So um, as part of the dye camp, we dyed uh, dock root and um, dock leaf. That's, that's the root there and that's a little bit of tie-dye done with that and then we've got some um the, the leaf is much more of a sort of um goldy yellow color but you know from a humble dock plan that's a, pr a pretty good result so we've now uh, working with um laura from the flower farm they are clearing their part of claver hill for with with dock at the moment so at the moment we've got a stack of boxes as high as this of, of dock roots which i'm slowly working through but i think it, it, it's a really nice angle to be involved with other groups as well um we've just done some really successful dyeing with purging buckthorn and that was working with food futures um, some of their members are trying to re-establish purging buckthorn in the Yorkshire Dales. So they were very keen to collect the seeds and we were very keen to collect what was ever was left of the berry to, um, to, to die with. So we had a really good day where we sort of sieved the, the berries and, and claimed the seeds and then got some absolutely superb um, dye stuff. Melanie also gave us some plants so we can establish those at Claver Hill. But it's a, a really amazing uh, plant that just gives you incredible colours from a really, really bright yellow through to sort of lovely greens on, on wool. Um, quite incredible and just sort of depending on what you do with it. A um, little bit about Lancaster water is pH neutral. So if you just use buckthorn um, straight with that, you're going to get, a, 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 that's very coming up pale on the screen, but it's actually quite a nice sort of sagey green. But if you alter your pH and you make it more alkaline, you get that color. And that was really interesting because Melanie had told us that for the plants to survive, we would need to add alkaline dressing to it. So it was just, ha ha, right, okay. So if the plant needs that, the dye bath probably needs that as well. So it's very interesting. That also got me thinking about other parts of the world where purging buckthorn uh, has been used a lot as a dye in the past um, and started to, mm -hmm. to think about, well, what's their, what's their pH there and stuff. Um, so there's a lot of, um, lot of sort of science and geography questions come to my mind as I'm going about these tasks. <laughs> Definitely. Well, I was really impressed by, and yeah, to let people know as well. So on the Sewing Cafe YouTube, and I'll put the links in the chat in a moment, but um, yeah, there's Gina has just done a lovely new video, um, which I'm going to be using with my students on my course actually as well, but also for Sewing Cafe. So it's a fuller video with Katrina going into more detail in how you can uh, die with some of these plants and the different techniques as well, isn't it? Like you just mentioned there, Katrina changing the pH of the water, yeah. or like ice extraction, like kind of all these different, you know, things that I would never have like trying to find out how, you know, and, and the different materials that they're put onto makes it like a big difference. Do you want to tell us about the mannequins behind you there, Katrina, as well? Yeah, yeah. So here we've got, um, we've got two, two products. These would be made dye me so we've got here we've got apron which is under dyed with tag teas and then over dyed with with madder and um and then we've got a cowl that's made so these are all made out of um sort of uh, fabric that we found um we sort of cleaned and sort of we're reusing it um, behind me, I've got a set of t-shirts here that this one is dyed with alder cones, which are borrowed from the Lancaster Canal. Um, and then we've, there's also one that was bramble dyed underneath. And then there's one that's alder and bramble there. So that's sort of dyeing the two together. There's a shirt there that's got a really wonderful uh, onion skin dye. I've uh, got some onion skin dyed wool here and then we've got there's a, 
whole range of rules here and these are going into the so-and-so boxes as, as uh, hopefully people will be inspired by those and want to do some really lovely visible mending with them. Um, and we've also got quite a lot of eco printing. This is probably where it's going to be collapse on my head. Um, but we love the direct approach of actually using leaves directly on, on cloth. And then so that's uh, the cloth, the leaves interacting with iron and leaving those amazing patterns. Uh, there's um, a shirt that's this is quite a nice um, illustration of what happens when you add other substances into the dye bath. So there's a shirt that's dyed with bramble and the bottom has been dipped in iron, which was just literally rusty nails in, um, in a pot with some water and vinegar. Um, and then that, that completely um, changes the effect of the dye. So that's something that once you get to know that technique, you can start to think from the point of view, okay, how can I really get the, the best out of that technique? So things like iron, copper, or all sorts of things, but you can just use those from, you know, you don't need to buy them as chemicals. You can, you can actually just find rusty bolts lying in the streets, or that's my urban foraging. <laughs> I love that. Like foraging, for, foraging for berries and then like bolts and rusty yeah. nails as well. Like yeah, something's <laughs> falling off the bottom of a lorry or something, just as useful. <laughs> and that leads us like quite nicely onto what I was going to ask you all about, you know, this project, like how is it kind of connecting you to them? Well, we've already talked about the landscape, but I guess the heritage of the area, because this would have been something you think that was done here in the past, right? But it's quite hard to find out how and what. And... Yeah, it's proven to be very difficult, that. I mean, I think, um, you know, tech, uh, Lancaster does have a sort of, uh, you know, big history in textiles and in, in getting on into sort of later Victorian period, it was particularly known for textile finishing. So there was quite a lot of printing here and that then fed into the, the lino industry and the oil cloth industry and things like that. But I think it's it's very difficult to actually to find out, um, you know, ab about just what what did ordinary people die with? Because I think there's very little information if you go through and start looking at uh, portraits of people and nearly always of rich people. So, you know, the, obviously they, the dyes that they would have had access to, they would have been able to get stuff that was imported from all over the world. But ordinary people would have just been looking at whatever was in their local hedgerows or things that were growing in, in their gardens. I, I suspect they would often be um, using plants that also had another purpose, you know, um, I, just like, you know, we found that you could, there's a lot of sort of food waste that you can die with. And I would suspect that that, that would be some, something that people used as well. The, there's a lot of dye stuffs that are, are really good for drying. So you could start to think, well, that would possibly, you know, if, if that was grown at that time, that's probably something that would be safe because you can store it up over the winter and use it but it but it's really something that we would like to know more about I mean it could be linked to um, you know the pH of the water um, you know lots of things I mean I would I would suspect that they probably had the the main three of being weld woad and, and matter I mean they're the three colors that have been definitely traced back to the beta tapestry um, another great example of how colour will actually be can be retained you know for, for all of that time um, but to actually find out I mean we would just love it if, if somebody could do some research around that and particularly find what what was popular in Lancaster I have found out about uh, one colour called Kendall Green which was a mixture of woad and weld so I suspect if they used it for Kendall they probably used that here too um, but it, it would be, I mean, I think the, the reason why we want to know, you know, what was successful in the past is because that would be likely to be successful now. Because I think like in any production of, of any um, agricultural thing, you, you know, you're, you're looking at what, what's going to be the most successful thing and what is most suited to, you know, to the soil conditions that, that you have. So if anybody knows anything about textile heritage, 
please let us know and the natural dyes that have been used here. Oh, I've got a frozen Becky now. <laughs> Um, I could show you some of our dye plants. <laughs> yeah, do that. And then if, if Becky's still frozen, there's a few questions in the chat that we could go to. Yeah, yeah. So I've got uh, just a little box of delights here of, of things that we've, we've dyed this, this year. Probably just looks like a remnant shop. Um, things that we've grown in our own in the from the dye garden we've got some calendula a very very pale and it's just going to look oh is she just holding up a bit of cream cloth it's actually a really really nice pale pale yellow we've got uh, some tajites which is really pretty shade of green but it's probably going to come out. The colour, I noticed I was checking it this morning, the colour, sorry, it's really, really bad on the screen. <laughs> but I think what's, what's really interesting is to see how different colours um, react on, on different fibres. So there we've got Tajites with a sort of greeny, browny colour on, on silk, and then we've got a much brighter um, which doesn't look bright at all, but it's bright from where I'm looking. <laughs> and, and that's on wool, and that's on our most local wool that we could find that's been commercially produced, which is from Northern Yarns, and that, that wool's from Korma. Awesome. Thank you, Katrina. That's brilliant. Sorry, my internet like chucks oh, me off there. So <laughs> I'm glad you are still like all just talking and like, you've got so many lovely things to share there. I was going to ask um, as well, just for, we've obviously put the web addresses and things in the chat, if there are ways that people can get involved. And I think Kiki's going to try and screen share your calendar as well, because you've got a calendar out at the moment, haven't you? Yeah, we've just finished that. Oh, have you just done that? Brilliant. We've just finished the calendar, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Are you there, Kiki? Can you screen share? I am, yeah. Let me just select which screen, otherwise you'll all get overwhelmed by all the things I have open on my computer. Um, <laughs> okay. Too many times. So this is um, the front cover. So we haven't printed yet. We actually have a um, pre-sale going on now so that we can just get an understanding because we also don't want to overprint and end up with a lot of waste. Um, so we're kind of doing pre-sale mostly and then we'll have a few extra available, but they're only five pounds and you can pick up for free in Lancaster. Um, this is the front cover. And so we just kind of go through and show a number of plants with their samples, um, which I think is the most interesting side of it, um, is getting to see that, you know, colors that may or may not be expected from certain plants. And these are all what Katrina's practiced on um, and photos taken by either Katrina or Gina or a few others within the group um, with a little bit of information. So um, we should be getting these, I think, first week of December. Fabulous. Thanks, Kiki. So yeah, people can pre-order them now, can't they? And uh, yes. yeah, so get your copy, you know where to get your copy from. That's brilliant. So I can see um, from the chat, Ellen, we've had a lot of questions, haven't we? Where should we uh, kick off? Yeah. Um, so there was a question from Laura. Um, I don't know if you, uh, Laura Ramsbottom, I don't know if you, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. It was about tips for setting up a garden, I think. Yeah, hi there. Um, uh, I have been doing natural dyeing for um, three or four years, um, but uh, I would like to grow my own dye garden in the future. I just wondered if you had any really good hints and tips as to maybe how to lay out the garden or um, plants that you found were more successful, less successful. It would be quite handy to know. Well, we we do have um, um, we do have a, a, a plant list that that we used in our kind of planning of start from. I mean, I'd be more than happy to to let you have a, a copy of that. Um, I think as far as how we laid it out, we've got two beds at Claver Hill that that we were laying out really to on how they were going to look because. For, for those beds, it was we were very keen that they're like a really great advert for natural dyeing and that 
people see them that as soon as they walk into Claver Hill um, and uh, you know they'll, they'll really notice it. I mean I think that the only distinct difference between the, the plants that we've got um, some things obviously are too big for the for the actual raised beds um, so that they're going to be planted around the nature trail at, at Claver Hill but we've also got the, the one main plant that we've put into a separate bed is the madder because that's um, a plant where you're going to be collecting the roots and, and you want to give the roots as much as possible so uh, as much space as possible so we put those in I think the the bed is about it's about 75 centimeters possibly above ground level so obviously the roots will be able to go into the ground as well so that that's really the only separation apart from things that are too large for a, a, a raised bed otherwise we've just kind of gone off you know planting conditions you know if something wants sun so we've just kind of followed the um you know what whatever the growing instructions would be for the seeds thank you Okay, great. And there was a question. Sorry, I think you're muted, Becky. Yeah, no, it's fine. I was just saying thank you. And, and like, have you got another question? Brilliant. Perfect. Um, so that Claire was asking about fixing dyes. Claire, do you want to ask your question and unmute yourself? Yeah, that was me. Um, yes, I've looked at doing dyes with plants before and so the use of fixatives always slightly put me off because it always seemed like you had to use like quite strong chemicals to fix the dye so I just wonder how you how you did that if you used other alternatives well at the moment we've been mainly using um alum um and I mean it's it's, it's a kind of mineral you know I, th I think it, it seems from what most stuff written about dyeing that that's one of the less problematic chemicals that, that you could use and it is naturally de derived um, we've I've, I've been finding that that's most effective particularly for cellulose if you mix that with tannin so recently I've started making my own tannin um, substance from acorns and it's really really easy to, to do so I'll be pursuing that in, in the future but also in we've got a bed in between our raised bed so it's just going to be completely dedicated to rhubarb so next year we're going to be um experimenting and, and testing out sort of how how fast we can get results if we use rhubarb leaf as a mordant oh that's really interesting great thank you okay great and then there was a question i think it's been partially answered in the chat from charlotte about Claver Hill, like what, you know, is it a garden? Can we visit it? I don't know, um, maybe Victoria, do you just want to say something for people that don't live in Lancaster and aren't familiar with Claver Hill about it? Sorry. Uh, yes, Claver Hill is in uh, Lancaster, close to the uh, Central uh, Grammar School. And at the moment, because of the COVID restrictions, it's, it's impossible to get, you know, to, to go and visit. But the plan is next year, we're going to run another camp out. So if you're interested, please send us um, an email. So in Cafe Lancaster and um, gmail.com. And let's see what happens. I mean, it's uncertain at the moment, but yeah, we hope that people can come and visit at the whole point. So please send us a message and then get in touch and join us. Uh, the group is uh, just I wanted to highlight the group is um, I mean it's, it's obviously Katrina is the uh, uh, the master dyer but we have a botanist that who is developing a uh, uh, a, um, a guide with the with the with all the plants that we are using not only in Clever Hill but foraging as well and that's going to be in the Museum of Chicago we are already already working on that we have gardeners we have a designer we have a you know like a lot of group of lots of different people who are learning but also knows a lot about different things so yeah lovely thanks victoria where are we up to now alan with questions i think we've covered most of them um there's a few comments about acorns and whether there was a separate comment about kind of crossover with local color pigments for paints so i don't know if either of those well, I saw that and I thought that that was really interesting um, and that might be a, an angle to, to research on because I think, again, you know, if a pigment's good for one thing, it's probably going to be good for something else. So 
that that would be a good line of research. I think somebody asked about colour from acorns, maybe on one of the questions. And all, all I'd say about that was when I was making my um, tannin liquid from my acorns, I was going, oh, I think there's some colour coming out of this. So, um, sorry, I'll, 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 I actually raised the question about the acorns. I've got a whopping oak tree at the back and lots of acorns. And so do you use the shell or the actual nut inside? It was the nut inside, but it was actually quite easy to, to crack them. You know, sort of I had about, I don't know, about a kilo of acorns and it's really quite a satisfying <laughs> touch out on the paving with a big mallet. Sort of, I've actually they, bought a nut cracker. Really really so. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Excellent, thanks. And I saw, was there one from like Charlotte about asking about as, as researchers have been researching the impact of acid dyes used by hand dyers? It, it's not something I've specifically researched into. Um, I would imagine, I mean, I think the actual colour compounds are, are very, very strong stuff. And, and I think it, it's, I, I've used acid dyes at, at home and the acid you're putting in is actually vinegar. So it's not as scary as it sounds. Um, mm. But it, it's kind of like, what do you do with the dye when you're finished is a problem. Because you've got a very, very sort of toxic mixture that you don't really want to pour down your drain. Thank you. Fabulous. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. And I mean, I'm sure if there are questions in the chat that didn't get answered, maybe some of those of you who are here from Selling Cafe will be able to like to post some replies. But yeah, it's just a fantastic project. And it certainly got me inspired. I've got a few like I've never done home dyeing before, but I've got some like old um, like long sleeve cotton t shirts that were once white now not white. So don't really want to wear them. But if I could make them a, a nicer colour then I, I would. So <laughs> I shall give us a yeah. go. <laughs> Brilliant. I shall try. And, and like I say, check out the Sewing Cafe YouTube and the longer video that Gina's just made with Katrina because it's, it's really lovely. And yeah, you know where to get your calendars from now. So we can have our seasonal food and seasonal clothes iron calendars. Brilliant. So thank you so much, uh, Katrina, Victoria, everyone for, for um, yeah, coming along and telling us about such a great project. So what I want to do now is to introduce, yeah, my friend Hannah, who's going to talk to us about basket making and kind of nature connection. So I'm going to read you to introduce what Hannah's going to speak to us about, because Hannah doesn't just do, she'll tell you, she doesn't just do basket making and cordage making. She does like forest school and yeah, a whole range of like nature connection work, really. And, you know, as Katrina has just really been describing, I think, you know, I mean, using plants for dyeing. So my own journey on this was that I started out obviously growing my own food or some of my own food. And that made me like more aware of obviously the plants in my in the garden and how they were doing. And, you know, like I, I would obviously, it, it becomes a relationship, doesn't it? I mean, I'm looking after them, they're looking after me. Um, but I realized, you know, that actually, you know, if you're looking at a plant and you know that it gives you dye or it's going to give you materials for like weaving or like this is all ways in which you can kind of extend that relationship and sort of see those um, you know those plants uh, throughout the seasons. So I'm going to read you an extract about basket making from like so this fabulous book Braiding Sweetgrass which I would really recommend it's it's totally it's a beautiful read if anyone knows like Robert, Robert McFarlane I think the style is like very similar in many ways. Um, and the author Robin Wall Kimmerer, she's a so she's a plant um, a plant biologist, plant ecologist, sorry, but she's also yeah a member of a of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, um, indigenous uh, nation in North America, and it's about yeah like her cultural teaching and how she's kind of you know incorporated that with her scientific uh, knowledge of like ecology and stuff, and she's talking here about um, learning how to make a traditional basket. So this is an extract from Braiding Sweetgrass that I'll just read here. The first two rows of the basket are the hardest. On the first go round, the splint seems to have a will of its own and wants to wander from the over under rhythm around the circle. It resists the pattern and looks all loose and wobbly. This is when John steps in to help, offering encouragement and a steady hand to anchor the escaping splints. The second row is almost as frustrating. The spacing is all wrong and you have to clamp the weaver in place to get it to stay. Even then it comes loose and slaps you in the face with its wet end. John just laughs. It's a mess of unruly pieces, nothing like a hole. But then there's the third row, my favorite. At this point, the tension of over is balanced by the tension of under and the opposing forces start to come into balance. 
the give and take reciprocity begins to take hold and the parts begin to become a whole. The weaving becomes easy as splints fall snugly into place. Order and stability emerge out of chaos. In weaving well-being for land and people, we need to pay attention to the lessons of the three rows. Ecological well-being and the laws of nature are always the first row. Without them, there is no basket of plenty. Only if that first circle is in place can we weave the second. The second reveals material welfare, the subsistence of human needs, economy built on ecology. But with only two rows in place, the basket is still in jeopardy of pulling apart. It's only when the third row comes that the first two can hold together. Here is, well, ecology, here is where ecology, economics and spirit are woven together. By using materials as if they were a gift and returning that gift through worthy use, we find balance. I think that third row goes by many names. Respect, reciprocity, all our relations. I think of it as the spirit row. Whatever the name, the three rows represent recognition that our lives depend on one another. Human needs being only one row in the basket that must hold us all. In relationship, the separate splints become a whole basket sturdy and resilient enough to carry us into the future. So yeah, um, that's just from one chapter in the book about making a black ash basket in particular, and there are many, many different types of baskets, which uh, yeah, Hannah can tell us about now. So Hannah, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself first and, and how and why you first got into making baskets? Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, it's been fabulous listening to the Natural Dyes project and this quote as well. I, I love the book too, by the way. Uh, find it amazing um, and I use other parts of plants than the natural dyes project so that just goes to show that there is so many useful bits um, I've seen the garden recently at Clover Hill and uh, loved it I, I came to the UK I'm German actually I came to the UK uh, quitting an office job I'd studied ecology and conservation planning and I wanted to learn green woodworking and coppicing and I traveled the UK working for various green workers and I came across a hazel hurdle maker and I started making hazel hurdles so that these big things that you used to fold the sheep in, um, which were very important in the medieval times and later in British economy. And now these days, obviously it's less for the sheep, it's more for the gardens, but they are lovely and amazing things. Uh, so I started weaving with wood and it's big pieces of wood and it's a real full body job and I absolutely loved it. I can't do the six footers, but you know, this, the lower stuff, it's amazing to wrestle with the pieces of wood. And then you have to have uh, the ability to force them into submission, but in a way so they don't break. So you always have to work with the material and the material is amazingly varied. Um, a studied friend of mine from Germany said, are you not getting bored doing this? And I thought, no, so not, because every piece is always different. And I've heard other craftspeople say that who've done similar baskets for years and they say it's still different every time. So I just find that utterly fascinating and humbling. And eventually I came to, uh, to willow basket courses which I got given in work exchange and after wrestling with big pieces of hazel it was just so much easier um, I loved it I still did both I still worked in making hurdles for a while uh, but eventually I had children and I wasn't working in the woods anymore I uh, just found that storing small bundles of willows much easier in a in a little house terraced house and I turned more to willow basket making there is a lot of plants that you can forage in the hedgerows and out on walks. Most people that I that come to my courses are people who love walking and rambling and usually gardeners as well. So, you know, you can't you don't just have to use willow that you forage or you can buy willow in, obviously, but hazel, dogwood, anything that you can basically wrap loosely around your wrist will be good for weaving straight shoots of something that has been cut back. There is ivy, there is bramble there's just a ton of things for the bigger baskets in Ireland for instance because they had less of a professional basket tradition but just isolated farmsteads who did it themselves they would use hay they would use straw they would use heather and they created amazing baskets I don't know how they do it it still beats me but you know really form well-formed baskets I tried to work with them and I would only use birch or heather or something in the sides of a basket so if you see a basket, there's, uh, there's the base and then there's the sides. And the sides are much easier to weave thicker material in. Awesome. And then 
sorry, lately yeah, sorry, I've turned, carry on, yeah. yeah, lately I've turned, uh, just very, very recently, I've experimented more with fibrous plants and, um, just a sec, and they make a, a very different kind of basket. So that's a, a tiny pouch. Oh, here's a different example of a pouch with a lid. And these are made from very different plants and they're quite soft. You can kind of mangle them a bit and they won't break. So that's uh, a quite exciting adventure into the world of fibers, uh, unlike textile fibers with twining. And you can use so many things, uh, grasses, iris leaves, cat, we, it's not cat, we cat tails, um, marsh rushes, juncus, or the big rushes. Uh, there's a wealth of things, bindweed, I'm sure even dog could be woven, I've not tried on that one, but um, anything that's pretty long and leafy it can be dried and then re-soaked and can be used. So it's just a whole new horizon that's coming up. That's brilliant, thanks Hannah, and yeah they all, I guess, you know, they all behave very differently, don't they? And then you're, that's leading you to look at, like, isn't it, basket making traditions from very different places as well? Yeah, for sure, yeah. And there's usually quite a strong component with people. So for instance, the Haida people, I think they were, um, who lived in the Western Red Cedar areas in North America, they, for them, Western Red Cedar was the tree that gave them everything, their clothes, their canoes, their shelters, just everything. And for them, that tree was not just a tree that they would look after, but it, it was like a, a spiritually, um, revered personhood so there's a, a really different way of interacting with the plants when you take on what they actually give you that you couldn't possibly make happen yourself definitely thanks so much Hannah and I can obviously I can screen share as well. let me know when you want me to screen share as we're talking as well because you know obviously we were going to talk about weren't we like we both really connected over this book like braiding sweet grass and you know uh, and you were telling me a lot about how you know what she wrote there about basket making being that this is more than just basket making this is about yeah connections with landscape and with each other how was that kind of um how is that something that's inspired you i guess how do you understand all of that i think it's it's probably similar to what the weaving the dye natural dye people do when you find just one vehicle or one bridge to go over, for some people that might be sport, for other people that might be food. Um, for me, it just happened to be vessels that you make that hold a lot. Uh, it then connects me in a way that having a box of bought materials that comes in with the postman could not possibly do. Um, I sent you a picture, Becky, of a, a sunny place with some plant heads if you just I will share it yes hang on let me just get the photos up I've got them so there's a journey in there there's there's the journey of the morning that I went out and the sunrise was amazing after days of rain there's the journey of finding the plants the smells the soil the other people I might meet if you get the picture that was on the canal and I met two people that I hadn't seen for a long time so this was just a stunning morning I was harvesting yellow flag iris this is not yellow flag iris it just looked really lovely so I just took pictures of that so all that goes into the baskets at the end and it's a bit like stored food if you've picked your own apples yeah no that one wasn't from me if you picked your own apples you'll always remember you know the day you picked them and they just have a different or the jam you made out of them or the jelly it just has a different component it gets more multi-dimensional so for me baskets are also quite a metaphorical thing there is so many dimensions about it that especially when I forage my own material but just the simple fact that you can you can take some very brittle pieces in this case it's twine it's not twigs but you can do the same for twigs you know I could easily snap one of these in my hand but if I join them together in a specific way so this is a, a little bundle of cordage that will be made into baskets if I join them together in a certain way, they get incredibly strong. And there's a, to me, there's, there's a, a metaphor or a, a symbolism for life in it that I didn't hold at the beginning. It just kind of gradually dawned on me that it's very similar to how a culture is crafted. There's very different ways of crafting cultures. You can kind of 
force a bundle of sticks together and tie them on the outside with fear or um, material motivation or something, or you can make it in the ways of a basket where many twigs, so in this panel here, there's as many twigs as uprights, and they are always crossing over one step before the next round is begun. So that's a very different way. There's a continual meeting and connecting of individuals. So I liken one person to one stick and the vessel that that creates, the cultural container that that creates is very unlike something that has been with a hot glue gun or something else stuck together artificially. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? How you're, you know, I've been, so Hannah's been teaching me just very, you know, very, I'm, I'm still very much a beginner at all of this, but I'm just amazed at how something that, yeah, that maybe singly isn't that strong that you can just snap and break, like actually it, it becomes really strong and really like it holds together without any need for glue. Like, you know, my, my, my A-level design technology projects were all held together by glue and sawdust, like in the joints that I'd failed to do properly. But this is like, yeah, it's really... You know it's super strong and i love that analogy that you know i guess you know we're all experiencing very challenging times aren't we at the moment with coronavirus but you know this idea that yeah i think in many ways maybe you know it it really shows doesn't it how well something is is kind of knitted together or isn't and i think many of us are, are feeling like we're just spending time this year trying to re-knit things that that feel like they're a bit broken so yeah yeah, and there's just such a wealth out there. And that's another thing I love about whether it's basket making or carving, I also teach spoon carving and um, deep nature connection techniques. It's just the linking back to the child passions. There's an exciting world out there. And if we get back to the bright eyed child way, then you go on a treasure hunt and you find all those treasures. Katrina's nodding. She's probably finding rusty bolts and she gets all excited because it's going to be her stock for getting the, the cider vinegar and whatnot thing going to dye the plants. And you find a, a bush that's got a lot of straight shoots and you go, Oh, I'm going to earmark that. And um, this is just a beautiful world. And this brings me back so much to it. And then I take home my wealth of bundles of sticks that I've gotten from the walk and, dry them a little bit and then I make something so that there's many times it gives joy and it, it goes just into the yeah into the joy and child state where we get things given for free and that in itself is amazing because it's so easy to forget and of course I forget constantly too but we get given breath we get given so much for free from the plants the plant nation is is just incredibly generous and we often don't know how to play with it anymore so for me, it's lovely to discover how to do that. Absolutely. I loved what, you know, I loved what you said there. And I think I remember, I can't remember what magazine it was in, but I remember reading this really lovely quote about trees saying like, you know, their out breath is our in breath, which really, you know, it really is true, isn't it? Like literally scientifically, like in every way. Um, and the other thing that you were saying there that really, it reminded me of when, so one of the first things that, um, that I did with Hannah so through I'm involved in um, Scotch Quarry Community Garden as well and we um, we ran like a festive willow wreath making workshop maybe four years ago or something now in the Gregson um, maybe more um, and yeah it was really nice because after the event so it turned into a really lovely and actually sewing cafe came as well and you were so Hannah was doing the willow making the willow wreaths and showing people how to do that and we had some greenery from Scotch Quarry and that people had bought from their own gardens that you could decorate your wreath with and also sewing cafe and victoria brought along some uh, yeah scrap kind of material and was showing people how to make fabric flowers so everyone was sort of like personalizing their own wreaths and chatting so you had this really nice process but then afterwards like it was so it was kind of connecting at the time but afterwards as well i loved that i could go around lancaster and I'd be like they went to our course you know they like, you can see on the doors and and i've had like i think rachel i know you're on here somewhere because i can see you posted in the chat and the first time i met rachel at work she was like are you a knitter? It's like she recognised, you know, from the jumper. So it's like you can, you know, it really, you mark other people out, don't you, by these objects that are like, that are personal and that are, yeah. So shall I show one of your other photos, Hannah? Like, shall I show, there's two more, aren't there? There's um, the basket being made and then there's the ropes of connection. Which one should I show first? Oh, just do the twine basket first because we've kind of covered that. And then the last one with the person. Yes. Let me just do that second. Hang on. Sorry, I'm just moving things around on my screen. It's the right place, share screen. 
So, so Becky mentioned Becky mentioned the connection uh, between people, obviously people that make world start recognizing. Um, so this is a sample of a fiber basket that I'm just getting into into that technique, um, which where you use twine plants. There's a variety of plants there. There is cat tail at the bottom, and then some darker crocosmia and light green crocosmia, and then the bases of the cat tail, which is um, hang on. Uh, I'll show the plant later. A really tall plant, long leaves that stand in the water, uh, are at the, the whitish bit at the top, which looks a bit like corn husks. And there is elm bark, elm bust, not just bark, but the bust underneath for the warp. And then the next picture is. We have to change this next picture. Um, let me get this picture. Is that there now? Uh, not, not yet. It's still oh, right. oh, hang on. I need to stop and start again. I think the way this works. Right. Let okay. me just go again. Uh, right now, it should come up. Hang on. Is that there now? No. Uh, yes, it is there now. So okay. this is the this is a the attempt to show ropes of connection and how it works. It's a little person, as you can see. Um, in this case, a little brownie puppet, and there is ropes of connection. The concept of the ropes of connection comes from the sand bushman, which apparently we all go back to. And there is the idea that we have thinner or thicker ropes of connection to someone. So if we're good friends, we'll have quite a strong rope of connection. And if we've never met someone, we might not have any rope of connection, and that's quite natural, but it might develop. So you can see on that picture, there's a little robin. So that person lives with the robin in the garden and they might feed it so they've got a little rope of connection there's also a tree the orange thread um and you know many people love trees maybe it's the tree in the garden so you will develop a stronger rope of connection there and there's an apple and a carrot so obviously food is something that many people have a strong rope of connection to especially if they've grown their own and the house works or doesn't work that tends to really activate us and then in my case, uh, on the right bottom right corner, you see a tiny basket and a wooden spoon. And that rope is slightly thicker. So I've made it slightly thicker because that's the rope of connection I have to these crafts is quite strong and developed. And it's, it's just to give an idea that same if you imagine a tent and you're putting up a tent and that tent gets only guide off in two directions that is not going to hold that tent very well when any kind of wind comes up. However, if it's tied off, guide off in many directions, then it becomes a much stronger structure. So the same goes for a person, a person that is much uh, sort of has developed many connections to the natural world. I'm not talking to the human world. Of course, that is very important too, but I'm just uh, talking about the nature connection side right now a person that has developed many strong ropes with uh, individuals or elements or beings in the natural world will usually be a much stronger person and there is a lot of evidence now scientific evidence that contact regular contact with nature enhances the mental health and well-being as well as the physical fitness and so on very massively so this is what the sand bushmen know all along and they've got incredibly strong ropes of connection intuitively but most of us will have some and it's whether we care to cultivate some a little bit more so that we develop that better resilience and simply more joy and gratitude in our lives so that's another part of my work which is more on the invisible side like the baskets and the carving to teach people nature connection techniques but I think any vehicle is a great vehicle. That's brilliant. Thanks so much, Hannah. And it, for me, again, that really underlines, like, you know, that what you know what I've got from working from you, and also you know from braiding sweetgrass is that, you know, like it's quite interesting. I remember um, when was it? It's probably a while ago now, wasn't it? Like ten years ago or so. Now, those of you um, people, UK people, um, remember Ray Mears, you know, and his survival skills stuff was sort of very popular and things and and that kind of seemed to lead to and again I'm you know I'm really generalizing here but some some if you look at you know like how to light a fire or something out you know like survival skills bushcrafty stuff like some of it like again not all of it but there's quite a lot of men doing it and it seems to be like you know it's about like it's real like let's smash down things with the machete and like you know it's a battle against nature and it's 
you know, survival, it's tough. And, and actually, you know, but the ways that, you know, Hannah and, and yep, yeah, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, like indigenous cultures, also, you know, lots of men that I know, you know, there's a very different way of, of surviving in nature, which is doing it through reciprocity and relationship rather than like domination. There is a difference, Becky, as well, between surviving and thriving. So what you point to, the cultures that actually really live in nature, and have lived successfully in the nature for a long time, like many of the Native American Indians, uh, like the Tan Bushmen, for instance, they have actually thrived, not just survived in very hostile conditions, partly, because they just had such an intricately interwoven relationship, or basket one could even say, with the world that they lived in. It, it, it was inseparable. And there was a strong sense of reciprocity of knowing exactly what you have to give to the plants in order to make them thrive and not just with a mechanical aspect there was this sense of reverence and gratitude and that made a huge difference definitely definitely and again i'm, I'm minded of you know in this book I, I really loved what she wrote and and what you said there and it links really well with what with what katrina and sewing cafe were saying as well that you know the creativity and all of this and that you know the stuff that you get back when you work in this way is amazing like the sense of achievement and the sense of kind of wonder and beauty and you know like she talks about in here she's you know um she's a lecturer like you know like i am and stuff and she talks about taking a first year kind of botany or ecology class with the students and she realizes that none of them can think of any beneficial relationships between people and people and nature it's all about like zero impact right so it's like we need zero emissions zero it's like what does that mean that means that we should all just get out and that we're just inherently bad on everything and and she says you know it doesn't have to be that way actually yes we will have an impact whatever we do has an impact but it can be a you know it can be a beneficial impact it can be a mutually like beneficial relationship um and to me that you know that all these kind of experiments with um you know with when you discover the joy of like yeah making a basket or doing something with natural dyes or like you know a new plant it's like this can all really yeah be a you know and it feels like yeah just kind of hope and creativity that we really need in the face of like all of these existential threats that we're you know constantly being told about I'm yeah, wondering, I'm sorry, in, yeah the, carry on. in the occupational therapy um they've really taken on board the concept of the flow state i can't pronounce the man's name um some kind of eastern european mihail something um but the flow state that we get into which is related to certain brain waves that we have um, when we're really absorbed and in a different sort of time zone, it feels like we're just out in a bubble. Uh, so that really easily happens whether you harvest or garden or make, unless it goes very wrong, obviously, then we might not be in the flow state. But many people will know that. And then, so that's on an individual level, but then there's the communal level that used to be so common that people would make together, same as they would gather together in smaller groups. Mm. And that has been a bit lost uh, to some, to many, um, but there is still that village spirit in us because actually as human beings, we are more than we are education beings, we're connective beings. Our, our nervous system is primed to connect with people, to connect with plants, just to connect. And I think that's not mainstream awareness anymore, how much we need connection on very many different levels. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, that's that's perfect. I've put, um, I'm wondering if we should get some questions because I've noticed there's quite a few things popping in on the chat. Um, I've put, Hannah, Hannah, I've put your details. Um, I've put Hannah's uh, Instagram, Facebook and email on the chat. If people want to find out about courses and other things, get on her mailing list for future events. Um, we're having a few, we were wanting to do, weren't we, um, some more courses through Scotch Quarry, Hannah, but we've been having trouble finding obviously venues and with lockdown at the moment, it's tricky, but um, yeah, we will. These, these things will definitely happen. So what questions have we had, Ellen? Are there questions we've had? Yeah, so there's a couple about um, sort of specific materials. So uh, Elena, um, do you want to ask yours about nettles? Right, yes. Um, I wondered actually if you've ever made a, a basket from nettle stalks. No, I haven't, but they're good for cordage. So you can make baskets out of cordage. It's a different, it's a specific technique, technique, but nettles are very strong, same as New Zealand flax or flax. So it's totally possible if you, if you go through the effort of fiddling and cleansing a lot of the fibers out and then making a lot of cordage, then it's absolutely doable. 
and it okay, would probably so, be so, quite a strong basket. It could be a kind of loop bag like the dilly bags in Australia. So you'd need to do a lot of processing first before it was usable. Yeah, it doesn't take ages, but it needs a bit of dedication. Yeah, and harvesting at the right time. And strong fingers. Yeah, I don't know about that so much. I mean, the 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 inner pulp peels off quite well if you get the right kind of plant at the right time but um yeah it still needs processing it's it's usually not that you snip a few bits of willow off or you snip a few nettle stalks off and then instantly you can make a, a beautiful basket it's not quite like that similar to the natural dyes you know there's a certain level of processing that needs to happen but once you know the the first few bits you know it's very possible to experiment and come to good results fairly quickly oh thank you very much let us know how you get on we'd like to see you see photos <laughs> yeah. and, and my swollen fingers from all the sting yeah. I, know. Well, I always uh, have like uh, sorry hey, you walk there elena um i use i go to the nettles when i've got repetitive strain and i seek out the stings because they help so maybe yeah, so that, that was similar to and again some some someone else on here might know the answer to this but that reminds me of so my old chemistry teacher from school apparently now has quite bad arthritis and he's a beekeeper and something went a little bit wrong and the bees stung him quite a lot but it got rid of his arthritis like so there's some sort of like antihistamine so maybe that's the same with the nettles it's who knew apparently the romans romans used to chuck themselves in nettles for like some therapeutic benefit or something um but yeah and there was another technical question you said we had Eleanor, not a technical question, a materials question. Yeah, so there was one from Andy um, who wants advice about his stool. Andy, would you like to unmute yourself? Hi there. Yeah, I was, um, I've been thinking about making a little uh, wooden stool uh, and I'd like to try to weave the top, make a woven top out of a natural material. Uh, I just wonder if you had any recommendations. Well, had you, have you done that sort of thing? stool tops and chair tops i've done a little bit yeah i've done a little bit i haven't done rush seating mm. that's quite an intricate method there is a variety of help books and youtube links on that as well but i i usually uh i've woven with elm bust so the inner part of the elm bark which is incredibly mm. strong and looks like leather in the end mm. uh i really like that i've seen people upcycle um seat belts from car seats and mm. the green work of that i've seen stuff from uh inner tubes so you can you can go quite wild but yeah what about so and it's rush seating would be the traditional thing i guess um bark seating is traditional too i think mm. the shaker tradition definitely used bark seats um it would astound me if they hadn't used uh, more bark seats um where elm is more popular it's probably getting hold of the elm. I don't know if you mm. could use willow bust. I've used willow for willow bark for basket making. I'm not sure I'd use it for a chair seat because it is just so much more pressure <laughs> than the yeah. elm. The elm is, is just incredibly strong somehow. Uh, you can use cattails instead of rush for the rush seating, but you'd still have to learn the method and I, I think know. it's time consuming. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. There's some a question. I can see um, Hannah as well here. Like uh, Gemma saying, "Well, this sounds wonderful. Thank you. How would a complete beginner get started? Do you know anybody running virtual or Zoom basket making courses at the moment? <laughs> Is that something we need to explore?" <laughs> oh my God. Uh, yeah. Hey Gemma. I don't know. I've not. I've not delved into that level. There is online basket making tutorials. So give it a shot. You know, simple English basket, twine baskets. Uh, there's good books. Um, Susie Vaughan, Baskets from the Hedgerow, is a good one for English round baskets. Uh, I can't tell you one for twine baskets. The other is one, I think, Elizabeth Jensen. She goes into a, a wealth of material on plant fibre baskets, different types. So just have a good search around. There is a lot online that you can learn from. I have also run classes recently with social distancing and lots of masks and lots of hand sanitizer so we're hoping to pick up with that in the new year when we've managed to solve the issue with venues but yeah just just get get started um you need the right material and so are you thinking of willow baskets Gemma 
are you thinking of willow baskets or of uh, twine fiber baskets um i, I don't know it's, it's completely new to me so um yeah just any really um i just thought it might be something to explore yeah great if it calls you go for it find out which one calls you more and start with that okay uh, it, there's a lot to learn for either so it's probably good to just uh think which one you want to start with and there honestly there is so much material on youtube uh and and some good books great lovely that's that's a good good start great. thank you good luck thanks brilliant thanks thanks hannah thanks Gemma. yeah it's really it's really interesting isn't it and um yeah there are so many different if, if people are interested in making a start with like um with uh, something very simple so again the lovely gina who's on this call as well somewhere is making some more films in relation to my course to which will Hannah will show you how to make do like a simple uh, willow wreath for, for the festive season that you can put on your door or give to someone that's a really nice simple project that doesn't take too long at all um just for Julia said so it's quite interesting and she's a really good point actually to just kind of make people aware of and again Hannah I'll let you answer this but I guess to me this would relate to what's in braiding sweetgrass because I've been asked this about foraging before she says I'm, I'm a bit alarmed about people wandering out into the countryside just getting twigs and stems and things and you know so wild plants are protected by law and I guess like wanting to make sure we don't over forage things I mean I guess my sort of thought on the on that would be um that again so in this in this book like in braiding sweetgrass where she talks a lot about like this you know these principles of like the honorable harvest so kind of no you know being really and again it's something that our society we you know we're not well versed in i guess and we're having to learn but that idea that you would you know in, in an indigenous um culture they would ask the plant for kind of permission for, and, that, and that includes you know a whole range of things but they would look at how healthy is it like is it able to support this you, you know, never take the first thing or the last thing that you see you would always give something back so maybe like scattering the seed of the plant elsewhere to kind of make more of it for someone else but again i don't know if you want to say any more about that hannah about like respectful foraging and how to make sure that yeah yeah as you say the book gives gives quite a good idea of how the the native way of um harvesting would have been bearing in mind that they would have supported a habitat so it wouldn't be like they just stumble over something and then get a load but usually they were quite carefully selecting and supporting a really good example was when the europeans came they thought the indians were too lazy to harvest all the wild rice well no they weren't they just left enough of the seeds so they would leave a good half or so um, for the ecosystem to be able to reproduce really well and stay sturdy. I think um, if you just try and just take a certain percentage and certainly not more than half and not something that is clearly rare and on in Germany, we've got these red lists. I'm sure you've got some equivalent here. Uh, obviously, I would completely disadvise from harvesting anything that is on any endangered species list. I personally live in town, so I do a lot of harvesting on industrial estates, uh, things like hospital grounds. Uh, there's a big dogwood plantations, New Zealand flax you get. Um, I'll show up New Zealand flax. It's, it's these huge long leaves with these um, funny spikes that over person height and one leaf will yield enough for a lot of cordage if you just start looking at what's in the estates and around these these big uh planting student homes and such like you usually find quite a lot and i don't have any problem harvesting there so long as i don't make it aesthetically you know un uncorrect or something because usually they get cut at some point in the year anyway so so use your common sense and uh get clued up first whether a plant is endangered or not perfect Thanks, Hannah. That's brilliant. Um, were there any other questions I've missed there, Ellen? Or uh... Uh, there was just a comment from Elizabeth about um, for people with like lower levels of energy, like things to do in things to do with with nature and the beneficial effects of that. I don't know if Elizabeth wants to say anything, or you want to pick up the theme. Oh yeah, so about yeah, I can see the comment now. So you know, Elizabeth, said, yeah, someone with chronic fatigue. I'm always interested in other ways that people can reconnect with nature, as the usual ways seem usually very active. So natural crafts seem like a good idea, and also for people that um, you know have social or economic issues that prevent them from accessing like more natural areas. So I guess again, that's something I, I think actually I guess that's something that. I mean, with Scotch Corrie that I tried to do a little bit. So it started off as just a gardening project and. Um, 
you know, and some people obviously love gardening and want to get involved in it and yeah it, but it can be quite energetic it can be quite physically strenuous it's not everyone's thing so actually that's one of the reasons why we started because it's you know it's not just a garden it's a it's a wider park and there are yeah there's like loads of dogwood that, that always you know needs to get pruned but it never gets used for anything so thought, well let's do you know why don't we make show other ways that people can engage and it seems like craft is a really nice way for people yeah with like maybe with with you know physical health issues or something for which active you know, more active pursuits are kind of you know are, are, are tricky i don't know if you've got any other thoughts on that Hannah, or yeah i would um i would recommend uh, looking into deep nature connection techniques which is also called eight shields so the number eight and then shields as in s-h-i-e-l-d-s um which we also started working with in the other projects so there's scotch quarry gardening group and then there's scotch quarry village green which has recently gone dormant for a variety of reasons but we we did for about a couple of years we did regular sessions on something uh, that had to do with deep nature connection techniques sensory awareness games and exercises um elizabeth what comes to mind for me directly is the sit spot which is a very very lovely and quite powerful routine where you regular regularly sit in a spot that's about one or two minutes from you where you can go so you can really go there easily uh, it can even be your backyard even if the backyard's tiny mostly there is a piece of nature in, in there that we can see if it's the sky and the birds and you just see what happens uh, so it's more an outward turn meditation rather than an inward one to see what happens in nature while I sit here for can be five minutes can be half an hour whichever you feel like and you do that quite regularly at different times in the year and you start really getting to know that spot you start seeing so in my backyard for instance which is very accessible for me um you know I, I notice how the robin comes back and the sparrows go at certain times of the year how the blackbird is trying to nest there in the shed next year it's there in this uh, bush in the neighbor's garden you know there's a, a crab apple tree two gardens down and the jackdaws really come for it and the magpies really come for it and you just start seeing what emerges at what time of the year what dies back the lovely yellowing leaves and how they die back which leaves go first how the soil smells when it's dry how the soil smells when it's just had a little rain so that to me has been an absolutely invaluable tool that i can't recommend highly enough the humble sit spot awesome thank you hannah thanks that's brilliant and yeah, I was going to, I think what we'll do now is I will, um, before we get, and I think there'll be loads of themes from all of this that Nigel, what Nigel's going to say will pick up on really well. So hopefully the order has like, has, um, you know, has worked well, but certainly people do get in touch with Hannah through her details in the chat if you're interested in future courses and stuff. And Laura said, oh, could, can we do stuff on Zoom, you know, can we do Zoom making workshops? So, you know, maybe that's something we can think about, like, but certainly, yeah, please do get in touch with Hannah if you want to be kind of like on her mailing list and find out about future future projects and courses. And I'll also let you all know when the kind of the, the festive wreath making video is kind of is available. So, um, yeah, I want to introduce, and I've just, that's really fortuitous because I've just seen a name pop up. So my friend Carolyn is on the call as well, who has a radio show, and Carolyn got me on a radio show to talk about this, which was lovely. And she said, uh, and I said, oh, I'd quite like to play some music, but I've got no idea what to play. And she said, you could play them this. So I'm going to play you this, which some of you might have seen already. I'm going to screen share it. Um, I'll play it to you. I think it's a song that will speak to a lot of us during this time. And then we'll chat to Nigel. So just to give me a moment to get it set up. Hang on. Right. Go and keep going, keep going on. Keep going on song. This is a keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going on. Keep going on song. This is a keep going, hey, keep going, hey, keep going, hey, keep going hey, on, keep going on song. I am this Abigail, going, and this is Sean, and going, we're so glad that you turned on, this on, and welcomed us into on, your home, and you are welcome into going, our home. Going, we're in Dayton, going, Ohio. Dayton, Ohio. Oh, we're in Sean's on. parents' house. <laughs> My parents. 
parents' house. <laughs> Sean's parents' house. We were in Louisville when the shit hit, and we packed our three-year-old into a car. We drove kind of far. We drove here, and we've been so lucky and blessed to be safely here. And we thought we'd be here for like ten days. Tops. What did we know? What did we know? What did, What did we, we know? Was? We thought we knew a lot. We thought we knew a lot.